Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we see all kinds of signs that tell us what kind of a world we live in. The various slogans that are on cars and on signs in lawns and so forth. You can see almost every kind of belief. Bit, pins, buttons, we have them for all the Reformation Festival, all kinds of pins and things that say to people who you are, what your identity is. From the signs around us, we can see that our society is becoming much more secular. That is, no one thing rules. Everybody goes after their own God, so to speak, small g. If you live in many American religious cities, especially the large cities, you'll see churches being converted into mosques and Buddhist temples or even into homes, as in the case here in Norfolk. Popular signs will read things like this house. In this house, we believe black lives matter. Women's rights are human rights. No human is illegal. Science is real. Love is love. Kindness is everything. That's a sign that I read on the West Coast in a newspaper that I read. The sign is a profession as well as a prophecy. Like the biblical Joshua, we are asked the question, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the King, Jesus. The biblical message today has diminished in the public realm. It's important for us, as we spoke earlier, about projecting forward generation to generation the bright hope of the coming of Christ. He will come again. He will set things to rights. He will set it straight. The world that is not as it should be will may be made new, a new creation. That is what St. Paul says today in our second lesson. You and I are people of faith, hope, and love. Jesus is and always will be on the throne of your heart. And the deeds that I encourage the children to do are really the deeds that all of us are called to because Christ is king and shepherd of love. Not any kind of love, as I told them. Because the, lo the love, love is love, love, we all love love, and so on. That is distorted, and the form of that love is what we proclaim because it is in the form of a cross. The crown upon that cross is really, as we just sang, a crown of thorns. We would rather suffer to be under the Lord's guidance and care than depart to these glitzy signs that are all around us today. The triune God says to us in a well-known old hymn, Have you not mid me love you, God and King, all your own soul, heart, and strength, and mind? I see your cross, there teach my heart to cling. Oh, let me seek you, oh, let me find. That is the kind of excitement to be in the Lord's rule. That is the kingdom, the power, and the glory that every day we say the Lord's Prayer. 
we yearn for, faith, hope, and love. I think of Acts 16, when God rescued Paul and Silas by breaking them out of jail. And when they broke free, the jailer yelled out, what must I do to be saved? And Paul responded, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. What happened next? Did the jailer just sit down and say, Whew, I'm going to heaven? No. He understood that faith is a living, daring, active presence of Christ ruling now in his heart. So he said to Paul and Silas, come to my house right away. He didn't know them. They're, they're in jail. He invites them to come over to his house. There he dressed their wounds. He fed them. All the things that we talk about in this gospel lesson for today. You know, that jailer was a Roman citizen and Philippi was a Roman city. And he was one who had to say, there is no king but Caesar. But now he said, I have no king but Jesus. And that was a new life. Who is our king today in our culture? Not evident, is it? We see signs all around, worship attendance dwindles, lack of knowing the biblical story as your story, not just facts of history, but promise upon promise upon promise that I hang my life on, that will sustain me in the hour of my death. We are a part of a community that is beloved by people very different than we are. Not a matter of economic class, whether I'm upper class or highly educated or poorly educated. We cross those barriers because we live in that kind of community the world doesn't understand. What is faith? What is hope? What is love? St. Paul says that it's all about Jesus being raised from the dead. The victory has taken place. And that victory is foreshadowed all the way through the Old Testament from the promises made to Adam and Eve, to Noah, to Abraham and Sarah, to Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, 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 especially David. He was the king, but oh, he was a sinner like you and I, a sinner dearly in need of forgiveness to create a clean heart and a new spirit within him, in him. And he found that grace when the prophet Nathan said, your sin has been put, put away. The good shepherd had reached the under shepherd. Serving each other is not a matter of being top dog. No, it is a matter of being a sheep. Secondly, Christians, we can find comfort that whatever we do in his name, nothing will be lost. This is not about telling us the good works that we must do in order on the last day to become a sheep. We don't become sheep because we decide to become sheep. We become sheep because God made us that in the waters of baptism, where he, through the Holy Spirit, began to rule your life. The passage, Matthew 25, which is our text, was one of the most dearly loved text by a famous man named Gandhi from India. 
a founder of a pacifist movement that was huge in the last century. Gandhi loved this passage. He said if he could find a Christian that lived up to this passage, he would become Christian. Gandhi had some demons in his own closet. He was not kind to his wife. He was abusive of her. And unfortunately, maybe he did not see the kind of kindness that we see here in Mount Olive or in our lives and throughout human history with all the, the struggles of our life about how the church has not been kind to women. That is exactly the wrong thing. It, what has elevated women in the life of the Christian church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the criteria for judgment of separating the sheep and the goats is not for us to decide, not for Gandhi or anyone else. We are declared righteous for the sake of Christ, and we are his people. Immediately following the final judgment scene in Matthew 25, our gospel lesson comes the events of the crucifixion. It's immediate that Jesus sets to go to the Passover. That is how, and the reason why Luther says in the small catechism, that Jesus has become my Lord. Not that he is my Lord, but he became my Lord through the cross. The crown of thorns of his suffering is how he rules over my sin and your sin. Our second lesson reminds us that the crucified one, Jesus, loses nothing that belongs to him. He lives and rules, beginning a new creation, all things made new in him. So we are called. We are gathered here like sheep. We are fed, we are enlightened for this dark age. When I'm with young people, I've noticed an increasing apocalyptic darkness. Have you seen this? The movies that young people watch these days? X-Men, Apocalypse, apocalypse of this sort or another. This kind of looming, dooming feeling. The other evening we were with our daughter and she was watching X-Men Apocalypse. And I said, uh, Anna, do you recognize the symbolism in this movie? Statements like, by the grace of God that we were saved. And we need to speak in terms that are hopeful. We live in a time when people are hungering, starving for hope, the suicide rate going way off the chart for young people these days because of a sense of loneliness, a sense of despair, there's no long-term vision of God's mercy grasping the world and rescuing the world. Young people sense what a great preacher, Reinhold Niebuhr, once said. He said, nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in just one lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. No virtuous act is quite as virtuous from the standpoint 
of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, forgiveness. As we know, our world increasingly says, like they did at the time of the crucifixion, we have no king but Caesar. Many people see the cross of Jesus as just an ornament, but not something that shapes their life, that is the shape of their story, that is the shape of what they pass on to the future generations. That's why I say we live in apocalyptic times, sorely in need of our Lord, the Lord of all hopefulness, the Lord of all love that is love, the Lord of all mercy that is real mercy. We are all recovering secularists who claim allegiance to the kings and the queens of this world consumerism and greed and quick fixes and all the things that we expect. We expect our circle of friends to always agree with us. We expect people to see our virtue. We love award ceremonies. We dream of ourselves taking all our trophies and being shining in the light and forget that all our trophies are to be put at the foot of the cross where they are melted. To nothing. We forget about death and the resurrection of the body. We forget about Christ the King. And we are all in need of the merciful forgiveness that Jesus Christ so freely gives us today. Amen.